Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we've got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today including the YouTube verification debacle along with all of these topics as well. You can see the full video index linked below in the description so let's get to it. And before we begin, I want to thank our newest supporters on the channel. Last week's premiere of the wrap-up saw a super chat from Chanflay98. I want to thank them for their support. We also have a number of other supporters coming in on the various platforms that we use here. Uh, so James I. Albert made a Patreon contribution. Baris Kaya made a donor box contribution. And Orlando Fladmark and Dr. Phoebe Rises are making contributions via the YouTube membership program. I want to thank everyone for their contributions to the channel, no matter which way they contributed. I also want to thank everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. So now let's take a look at the week in review. And on the Extras channel, we unboxed the new iPhone 11 Pro the day it came out. And one of the neat things about the Extras channel is that it's a good way to gauge consumer response to new products. And typically, when I unbox a new Apple product on the Extras channel the day of release, we get a ton of traffic, at least for that channel. This one did about what our videos usually do. And that leads me to think that there might not be so much consumer enthusiasm about these new iPhones, given they are so similar to the last set that came out a year ago. Uh, but we'll have to keep an eye on the main review to see how that one does. But that one also did about a typical viewership for this channel. And we'll see if it does better over the longer haul. Uh, we also went out to New York City for a show uh, from a company called Pepcom. What they do is they get a bunch of consumer electronics companies in a room together, a lot of big brands actually. And we walk through and see what's new and interesting. So check it out. Uh, very similar coverage style to what we do at CES and what we did at IFA. I know a lot of you like those videos. I was hoping to get a few more views on this one, so check it out in the master playlist down below if you haven't already. And we looked at a USB-C hub from Minix that has built-in storage in addition to HDMI power delivery and two USB ports. It's a neat little device, and you can see more, again, linked down below in the master playlist. And this weekend, September 28th and 29th of 2019, I'm going to be a guest at Retro World Expo in Hartford, Connecticut. I've got a couple of things I'm doing there. So from 1 to 2 p.m. on Saturday, I'm going to be doing a panel on FPGA game consoles and the Mister with Bob from Retro RGB. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to do our best to record the panel and then upload it to the channel a little bit later. Uh, so if you can't make it, we'll have a recording of it. And I'm hoping to have a few different cameras there and some other stuff. We'll see if I can get it all set up in time. Uh, we're also going to have a meet and greet uh, on Saturday from 2 to 3 p.m. with Game Dave and Pam from Cannot Be Tame. Those are two other YouTube creators. And then on Sunday, I'm going to have a meet and greet uh, with Shane and Adam of ReRes, along with Chris Alemo from Classic Gaming Quarterly. And it's going to be a lot of fun to hang out with some of the creators that I watch all the time, and I know a lot of you watch them as well. Uh, so let me know if you want me to send any greetings to them down below in the comments. And if you can make it to Retro World Expo, I hope to meet you there. Really looking forward to the panel that we're going to be doing with Retro RGB. And now it's time for some things in the news that caught my eye. And it looks like DirecTV is still facing a lot of challenges here. So many that AT&T, according to Ars Technica, is looking at spinning off the entire division. As we talked about a few weeks ago, uh, there are millions of people cutting the cord, and most of them are coming out of DirecTV's subscriber counts, both their satellite service and the streaming service. Uh, if you look at Comcast and other cable providers, uh, they still win if people cut the cord because they are keeping their internet connections intact from those companies, just dropping the TV side of the business. AT&T really doesn't have a viable internet service right now. And that is certainly costing them because when customers cut the cord, they cut off the relationship with AT&T almost entirely. AT&T also sold off a lot of their wireline phone business over the last couple of years as well. So they just don't have anything to compete uh, with people looking to cut the cord and stream over the internet. Another thing in this article worth checking out is a class action lawsuit that uh, they write about here. Uh, this is from shareholders alleging that uh, AT&T lied to them about the failure of the DirecTV Now streaming service. And the lawsuit was updated last week because there are some new allegations from 
uh, the AT&T retail division. Some whistleblowers have come forward to say that they were setting up fake DirecTV streaming accounts when customers came in to update their cell phone. And now the customer never saw this happen. Most of them were not charged for it, but they finagled the numbers allegedly in a way that they could create a new account, make the service look healthier, and then they would cancel the account when it re reached the end of its trial period or whatever they had set up for it. Pretty complicated and in-depth, but definitely check it out. It looks like DirecTV is in real trouble here. And in a related story from Cord Cutter News, 98% of cord cutters say that they will never go back to cable television. And this is certainly no surprise. This is a result of a new study from Roku that you can read about at the link you see on screen. And while it's great that we have more choices for content, I wish we had more choices for internet because that's where the new monopolies lie. And hopefully we'll see some more choices as the decade commences here. And if you are using YouTube's Lean Back web interface to watch your videos, it is coming to an end on October 2nd. Uh, this is something that a lot of unofficial YouTube apps use. It's also what the Fire TV was using before they made amends with YouTube over their dispute that went on for many years. I think this is going to impact a lot of people, and I'm sure that YouTube is doing this to push people to use their official app versus all of these unofficial offerings. Uh, so if you are using Lean Back, be advised the day of reckoning for you is on October 2nd. After that, you're going to be going back to the regular web interface. And on the topic of YouTube, we have yet another YouTube debacle to talk about this week, this time involving the verification check mark that appears next to the names of many creators on the platform, myself included. These check marks appear in search results, they appear on your channel, they also appear in chats and on comments so that when you are leaving a comment, they know that you are the person leaving it and not some impersonator that's out there. A bigger issue for celebrities, but it's also a big issue for channels like mine where a lot of people re-upload my content and put their own affiliate links next to it and might confuse people as to who exactly I am. And I think it's important that that check mark exists for creators both large and small. Now this debacle is yet another example of YouTube not talking to the creator community before rolling out a major policy change. And it followed the same pattern we've seen before. They announced the change, there's a huge amount of backlash, they defend it, and then a day later they reverse it. And that's exactly what happened here. So let's step through what exactly happened. So while I am in New York, uh, walking over to cover that event uh, that, we, that we shot at Pepcom last week, I get this email on my phone telling me that they're changing the verification criteria. This came out of nowhere. Nobody asked me about this first. There was no lead up to this. It just got dumped on us. And they said, we hope you liked your check mark, but unfortunately, with the changes we're making, your channel no longer meets the criteria. They don't tell you what the criteria is, just that your channel doesn't meet it. And what was interesting in this process is that there were a lot of large creators who were losing their check marks and a lot of smaller ones who were keeping it. And it looks like this is yet again the AI algorithm stuff doing things without any human judgment behind it. Now what they did offer you was the ability to appeal it and you could fill out a Google form and show them some examples of where you might appear in outside media in the hopes that perhaps they might change their mind before they implement this change uh, later on. Now my big gripe with this was the fact that YouTube really didn't give any reasoning behind it. Uh, they did post on Twitter when the backlash began to say that we're helping this, making this change to help everyone determine whether a channel is official or not. Uh, please know that badge or no badge, you're an important part of YouTube. And they're making it out to be like this is no big deal. But my questions were, what's the rationale, first of all? If impersonation is the rationale, okay. But what are the criteria that you're using to decide whether or not someone is at risk for this issue? Because my impersonation problem is not as bad as maybe Will Smith's is, but it's nonetheless something that can harm my business and I should have the opportunity to continue uh, being able to indicate that this channel is the official source of these videos that you might be seeing out there. But the bigger question is, what's the impact on my business overall? And that wasn't answered at all in YouTube's communications. Now, the reason why I was so concerned from a business perspective is that 80% of my traffic comes from search results. And if losing that check mark is going to impact my search position, that could materially impact this business to the point where I may not be able to continue doing it anymore. And that was my biggest concern because all they told us was that your monetization is going to stay the same, which is fine, but it doesn't mean that my search results are going to stay the same. Let me show you some examples of this. 
Uh, this is a front page search result for iPhone 11 reviews. And as you can see here, every one of these front page uh, reviews is coming from a verified channel with a check mark. This is a top tier product. It's often hard for me to get traffic to begin with, but you can see here every one of these search results has a check mark next to it. And just to be cross platform, I did a similar search for the Samsung Galaxy S10, and sure enough, all of the front page search results have a check mark, which means that these channels are more likely uh, to get picked up in viewer searches and recommendations because these videos, apparently, according to the platform, are the top videos for this product review. And my concern is that. I don't know whether or not that check mark has anything that the search engine is looking for in deciding how to rank things. It might not, but maybe it does. And that was one thing that YouTube didn't communicate to us about what would happen to search position. I would have been okay with it if they said, this doesn't impact your search position, your recommendations aren't impacted by whether or not you have a check on it or not. If that was the case, I would have been more okay. Uh, but I'm still concerned over the fact that if you lose your check mark, that might mean someone who's searching might be less likely to click on the video, even if it did have a good search position, because they might think the check mark is a greater indicator of that channel's validity versus one that doesn't have one. So, you know, just so many questions that came out of this that YouTube just didn't even address, and they never address any of this stuff. And it really uh, made me concerned and a bit anxious, to be honest with you, about whether or not my channel could even continue after losing that check mark if it would result in a material change to my search position. Now, of course, after the backlash occurred, YouTube decided to change course. They sent out an email the next day saying, hey, we're just kidding, we're not doing it at all, um, but they might be doing some back-end verification now to make sure that you're, uh, you are who you say you are. So it looks like nobody at the moment is going to lose their verified badge, but I'm sure they're gonna come back at some point. But what really struck me here was that the language changed. So when they were giving their reasoning for doing this, they said impersonation initially was the reason, but in this email response now, they're saying it was only one of the goals. But they never said what the other goals were. What was it that made them want to do this in such an extreme fashion so quickly? And this is just another example of just how frustrating it is to be a mid-level creator on this platform because this kind of stuff happens all the time and they never give any good rationale behind these major policy decisions Yet other things they're more open about, and there's just a lack of consistency, and it's hard to run a business around this because you don't know what's going on. Now look, I don't have a sense of entitlement here. Ultimately, YouTube is running a business, and my business needs to be compatible with the economics of theirs, which is fine, but I would like to know every once in a while if there is a shift coming to the economics of how they do business, we should know about it so that we can plan accordingly. This is just another example of how things just get dumped out on us, and we have no idea what the reasoning is behind it, and we still don't. Now, right before this email was sent out, they had the CEO jump onto another platform, Twitter, to communicate with the rest of the community because we don't have a good communication system inside of YouTube to have these discussions. And they probably had half a dozen people work on the response here, uh, you know, acknowledging the frustration and hurt that we've caused. And while we're trying to make improvements, uh, we missed the mark, a great corporate uh, word for when you want to do a mea culpa. Uh, but this doesn't really solve the problem because this happens all the time. I'm sick of them apologizing. They wouldn't have to do this if they just talked to some people first before they made this decision. I think everyone who saw this thought it was a really stupid idea, uh, but nobody inside did. And this, again, is not the only time that this has happened to YouTube. And I think they need to change some things. Now, the first question is, why is there always so much secrecy? Now, in the past, they've stated they didn't want people gaming the algorithm and maybe improving their rankings uh, if they knew exactly what was going into it. But I'm not buying that anymore. These are really smart people with some really advanced algorithms and artificial intelligence. If they can't detect fraud by now, they're really in trouble. And I think it's only fair to us in the creator community to know that if they're changing the signals that their search engine is looking for when recommending videos or putting them in front of subscribers, then we have a right to know about that as their partners in this endeavor. If it's for competitive reasons, I'm not buying that either because of YouTube's market position. Let's look at some of the unique market strengths that they have. YouTube is currently the number two most visited site in the world next to Google. 
and of just about every metric that you look at, YouTube is even above some of the largest sites in China that are heavily trafficked. This site has a billion people a month, if not more, looking at it. A good chunk of the world's population is watching YouTube from one day to the next. It is the dominant democratized content platform. The only thing that comes closer to it is probably Twitch, but even then, uh, I think they've got a much better content discovery engine than Twitch has. And as you can see on that third bullet there, they have minimal content acquisition costs. They are paying for a couple of shows like Cobra Kai and a few other things, but really a bulk of their content is coming from people making it and putting it on the platform for free. Netflix just spent half a billion dollars on Seinfeld, which is a 20-year-old TV show. YouTube, by comparison, isn't paying much of anything to get the content on this platform, and they've got a lot of people who want to watch all of it. And finally, it is the easiest place, quote unquote, uh, to grow and earn a living. I started from scratch. I didn't come in with a fan base from some other platform or a TV station or something. The algorithm and the search results just kind of put me up in front of people and all 230,000 of you who subscribe found me in that way. There is no other platform on the internet that as, is as effective at this than YouTube. This is it. I can tell you that. I've tried every platform that's out there. I was on Facebook doing more on there when they had a little thing going for YouTube creators. It fell flat because ultimately this is what is working for people right now and they've got a dominant market position for independent creators and competitively there is nothing I think that will knock them off of that pedestal short of some kind of government antitrust case. But I think the bigger issue at stake here is the fact that YouTube really doesn't have a mechanism to listen to the larger community, especially those of us in the YouTube middle class or those who are first starting out. And I think the issue really comes down to the YouTube business model compared to the owner of YouTube. So YouTube has almost a cooperative kind of approach to it in that the platform would not exist without these content creators producing video to put on the platform. Google, the company that owns YouTube, is a search engine with customers. They have people that buy ads on the search engine, but there's really no creativity, there's no content being put into that search engine. It is crawling the web and looking for things and people are advertising on it and they can have a standard customer relationship there. It's very different in a cooperative where those of us who don't own YouTube are actually contributing to its success and I think they need to treat the community a lot differently perhaps than Google is treating their search engine customers or perhaps how their Nest thermostat division is treating the retailers they're selling thermostats to. I think there's a very different model here and they're trying to apply the corporate communication model that works throughout the rest of the company to YouTube and it falls flat every time. Now YouTube does listen to some of the top tier creators and of course we had the YouTube Rewind from 2018 that was an absolute disaster for the company, 16 million downvotes. It was a high budget production. It had Will Smith in it and then a lot of top tier creators who were probably compensated for their participation in that. But the rest of us are saying, hey, what about us? Why aren't we getting a seat at the table here to discuss some of our anxieties and some of our suggestions for trying to make the platform better? And you can see this woven in throughout all of the things that YouTube does do in official capacities with creators. Most of the time they are maybe doing an interview with the CEO, but it's usually top tier creators doing that. Uh, they brought a bunch to the White House a few years ago that were, again, mostly top tier folks. Uh, they also have tutorial videos that people are doing on behalf of YouTube for their channels and they're getting compensated for that. So as a result of this, by giving out access and paying them to do different things, they're not going to hear an honest opinion. And honestly, I think Marcus Brownlee is going to have a very different view of the platform uh, where he's at versus where I'm at. I'm not jealous of him, I'm proud of what he's been able to build. I hope to be able to build up to that one day, but really the struggles that I have starting out in this era versus when he started are very different. And I don't think the platform has been listening to some of those concerns because clearly things like the verification uh, debacle that happened this week are a good example of them not listening to those of us who really think that verification badge is an important part of our brand. Now, I don't want to be all negative here, so we're going to now focus on a few positive things. One is something YouTube is doing, I think, to better communicate with us creators. And the other is some ideas that I have for maybe making this communication issue a little bit better in the future. And it's not all that hard for them to do, but they do have to loosen up the reins a bit. So let's start off with the things that I'm hopeful about. I am a big fan of the Creator Insider channel. 
Uh, this started as a stealth effort from this guy, Tom, uh, who is one of the product managers of the YouTube back end. The YouTube Creator Studio is one of Tom's responsibilities. And he started this channel kind of as an employee-driven thing to try to better outreach to creators. I'm guessing, I didn't hear this from him, but I'm just going to guess that the reason for creating this was because perhaps some people inside were frustrated over the perceptions of the creator community about the company. And over the years, this channel has proven to be a very good resource for me and others. And if you don't know about it and are concerned about YouTube's issues related to creators, you should definitely subscribe to it and check it out. Uh, we interviewed Tom on this channel about a year and a half ago. So if you want to get more information about what led to the creation of the channel, definitely check out that video, which I'll link to in the video description. Uh, and if you go on there, you can see there's some really good stuff here. They've got uh, some things that they're doing right now to try to get revenue for people who have yellowed out videos. Uh, so one thing the platform is working on right now is to go out and find advertisers for videos that might not meet the criteria for general advertisers, but might be really well suited for an R-rated movie, for example. If you've got some raunchy comedy skit, a raunchy comedy movie would definitely want to advertise on that. So they're making some efforts here to try to get that demonetization thing a little less painful for people out there trying to do stuff that might not meet the criteria that general advertisers are looking for. Um, again, just day after day, they post up a lot of news and other information, but they don't tell them everything, which is the problem here. So uh, Creator Insider didn't know about the verification thing because they didn't talk about it. So this is the kind of stuff I think that they should be making more use of. And if there is a big important policy decision that's on the way, perhaps filtering it through Creator Insider for feedback first might be a helpful way of preventing future uh, missteps like they had this past week. But ultimately, for fixing creator relations, I think they need to do a little bit more. I think they need to acknowledge that there is a class of creators out there that are not on the top tier, that depend on some stability in how things work for their living, and they should be acknowledging that and maybe getting more feedback from us in a way that I think would be more constructive. And they could do that perhaps through the creation of something called a public editor or maybe create a panel of public editors. Uh, this concept existed in the newspaper industry. It still does on some newspapers where they hire people that are working for the paper but are in an independent office that can be critical of the publication and take in a lot of reader feedback and a lot of the things that they're hearing out there and trying to get the editorial staff to recognize what the public is thinking and feeling uh, when certain things are published or happen within a publication. And I think perhaps creating a creator version of that inside of YouTube where you have people that are independent of the process, that are brought into the major decisions to represent the viewpoints of the community, and the corporation may not agree with that. They may make a counter decision to what uh, the creators are talking about, but I think it would give uh, the creator community a lot more confidence to know they've got people on the inside that are not you know, going to have to worry about losing their stature in the search engine or losing their revenue, uh, who could be independent voices but with a seat at the table. This is a hard thing for people to do, uh, but I think it's something that would really benefit YouTube based on the cooperative nature of its business model. Right now, we have a co-op without the actual uh, people at the table helping to determine the course of the, of the institution here. And I think this would really help quite a bit if they could create a mechanism by which a regular group of people who are representing the creator community can be part of those discussions, can hear all the reasons why they're doing what they're doing, and be able to provide some back and forth uh, out to the creators at large so that these decisions can be made in a way that people understand, if not always accept. And my Q&A for you this week are what your opinions are on this whole disaster that took place in the last week or so. Uh, but I want to add a caveat to this in that if you are going to complain about YouTube, you've got to provide an idea as to how they can be better. Uh, so give it a shot down in the comments below, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. And I have no doubt we'll have a video next week on some of the things that you said. So have at it. I look forward to reading them. And now it's time for a Q&A from you, the viewers. And our first question comes in from JJ Robles in regards to the Minix stock we reviewed this past week. Now, in that review, I used my combo Logitech a keyboard and trackpad here. It's still dead, I'm charging it again, uh, which has a mouse integrated along with the keyboard. And when we got the dock connected up to my iPad, we could use the keyboard, but not the mouse. And I said, the reason why the mouse doesn't work is because the iPad and iPhone don't support mice. Uh, but the new version of iOS 13 does bring some mouse support 
to the mix and I wanted to demo how to turn it on and what it looks like. So let's take a look at my iPad here. Uh, we're going to pull up the settings menu and go over to accessibility. Uh, the next thing you want to do is go over to touch and what you want to do is turn on assistive touch and when you do that uh, you will suddenly get a mouse cursor that you can use with a standard USB or Bluetooth mouse. You can see it's working here on screen, right? Uh, but this is not a mouse like you're used to. So on Android, when you plug a mouse into your phone or tablet, you'll get a mouse pointer. The left click and right click work as you would expect it to, like it would on a PC. Here it's a little bit different because the mouse is largely replicating what you would normally do with your finger. Uh, now I can do like a two finger scroll here on the screen, which seems to work. But if I right click, for example, I'm not going to get a context menu. Uh, instead, I'm going to get uh, this accessibility menu that helps me do certain things. So for example, if I want to go home, I can hit the home button here. Instead of having to do a swipe up from the bottom, I can then, of course, uh, pull up some other things like my notifications. You can customize this to do different things, but this is really not a mouse in the true sense of the words. So you get your left click. I can click on different articles here and use it that way. I can do, I believe, uh, some text selection if I hold things down, but it really replicates the way a finger would work and it doesn't add some of the mouse context that we're used to. So it's a mouse, but not the mouse that you're expecting. But it is there now on iOS 13 and in the new iPad OS if you want to use a mouse on your iPad or iPhone. Now last week we were talking about how far ahead of its time Star Trek The Experience was at the Las Vegas Hilton. Uh, they did a lot of what Star Wars is doing at the Disney parks, and it was a fun discussion. You can check out last week's wrap-up to catch up on that if you missed it. Uh, but I got reminded of something else that was happening sort of around the same time uh, from Thomas Hendricks, and this was at Universal Studios. They had something called Star Trek The Adventure, and it wasn't so much a ride as it was kind of a make-your-own-movie thing. And you paid some money and they brought you into a little studio where they put you into Star Trek uniforms. And my family did this actually back in 1991. Uh, the whole thing is shot against the blue screen so you don't actually see anything that you're interacting with, including this scene here, which was just all dubbed in in real time as you were recording it. This was all on tape. And what would happen would be they'd do a little intro with Shatner and with Leonard Nimoy and they had Gene Roddenberry do something at the outset also. And then the movie itself involves some of these pre-recorded scenes with the cast, and then they would cut to you on the bridge of the Enterprise here. So that's my sister and brother there. Uh, they're all a lot older now. This was like 28 years ago, but it was pretty fun. And that will lead us over to our pick of the week if you want to see more of this, because uh, these things are all over YouTube. You won't find mine on there. Uh, but you will see a bunch of other families who have done this. And it's funny, these, these almost all look the same uh, because they are all the same, uh, but you can see different people acting in it. And I have a search saved here that you can find at the link you see on screen. And maybe we can go through and find some of the best ones and make a playlist or something. That might be kind of fun, but there's a lot of these on YouTube. So if you're curious about Star Trek The Adventure, you can see it here on screen. Now this week on the channel, I've got a couple of things planned, and I'm sure there'll be other things that will pop up as well. Uh, we have the Blink review of those inexpensive security cameras recorded and ready to go. It got preempted by the iPhone 11 Pro, but we'll get this thing up uh, probably in the next day or two. Uh, we also just got in a new low-cost PC from Acer. It's actually been out for a little while, but new to me. Uh, this was like $300, and it's powered by a Ryzen processor. And we just got it in about 20 minutes ago, so we're going to unpack it, unbox it for the Extras channel, and then Jake is going to do his magic with it, and we'll see how this compares to other Intel devices that cost about the same. I suspect this one's going to do pretty well, uh, so be on the lookout for that. We bought this one, so one of you will end up buying it very shortly, so get your uh, mouse buttons ready for when it pops up on the store. Uh, we also uh, got in a new battery from Lenovo. This is designed to, of course, charge your phone, but it also has a USB-C output that can deliver 45 watts of power. Uh, so it's a fast charger and it's usually enough to power most laptops as well, at least the ones that have a USB-C port on it. So we'll be taking a quick look at that one a little later and then a bunch of other stuff too. We're getting into the holiday season now because like the shopping is gonna really kick in uh, towards the end of October for folks. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of stuff hopefully to get a lot of content up some of it will be on the Extras channel, some will be here. 
Uh, so be sure to set your notifications appropriately. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also support, of course, the YouTube membership program for our $1 and $5 tiers. So if you want a more convenient way, uh, that is available to you and you'll get these cool little badges to go with it as well. Uh, what's funny is that I would have lost my badge, but you can keep yours. So that's a good thing, right? Uh, so that is another option that we're offering the folks. And of course, we have our ongoing relationship with Plex, where if you uh, make a Plex account and do it without a credit card, we get a small commission and then we get a larger commission if you buy a Plex Pass or gift it to somebody else. It's a great media serving application. We have other channels you can follow me on, including the Extras channel that I mentioned a few minutes ago. We do unboxings and supplementary content there. It's a good way to see what's coming up on this channel. We have my podcast, which is an audio version of this show at lon.tv slash podcast and in all of your favorite podcasting applications. We have the Snippets channel where we take uh, individual portions of this show as well as some of the dispatch videos I do and put them up in a more search-friendly manner. So it's a good little uh, booster for some of the content that's longer form on this channel. So you can subscribe to that. And then we have my live stream archive at lon.tv slash live streams uh, where we post things live and we archive them in that live stream feed. There's hours of content there. If you want to be notified, click the bell. Every time I do anything, you will get some kind of notification, I hope. That's been another area of concern for us creators, but usually it works. So click it if you want. And then we have my email list at lon.tv slash email, which I will use when we go out and do some special event. Uh, we have my Facebook page at lon.tv slash Facebook. We got the Facebook group, which is growing every day. One of my favorite places on the internet right now because I can connect with all of you and you can all connect with each other. It is great. So check it out and join 700 other fans of the show. And of course, we've got the lon.tv store where we sell things that we've previously reviewed here on the channel, including that laptop that will be up there at some point in the very near future. And you can get alerted every time I add something to the store by going to the address that you see on here. Uh, there's usually only one of everything because it's the item we bought to review here on the channel. And most of the time these things are well below retail and only used a couple of times for the course of the reviews that we do on here. So that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all for bearing with me as I uh, told you my thoughts on YouTube and how it might improve. Hopefully somebody from YouTube might watch this and maybe take some ideas and from me and others and maybe make things a little better for everybody on the platform, including them. Uh, we'll have to see what happens with that. But in the meantime, let me know what you thought down in the comments below. Again, I wanna thank you all for your continued viewership and support of the channel. All of this happens because of you. And with any luck, YouTube will keep putting these videos in front of you so it can continue. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Mike Talbert, Brian Parker, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.